speaker from outside our region. Um, we have Tom Avil. He's here from the east side, and he's going to talk to us about replant disease. Good morning. I've worked uh, in the Lake Chelan Valley uh, for 20 years looking at uh, production practices. Um, and, and our number one problem was getting new trees to grow in, in old soils. We progressed to the point in the tree fruit industry to uh, uh, label a replant problem with a four-letter four letter acronym, uh, and it's specific apple replant disease. The only thing specific is the name. There's a whole complex of uh, root rots and nematodes and tin line June beetle, lots of things that come into play that uh, affect our problem. And, and so I didn't go to the effort to try to create the uh, important part of disease cycles. You know, we have uh, a susceptible host, uh, the environment, and then the presence of the pathogen. And as we bring those circles of risk together, uh, we can create epidemics. And, and so oftentimes we have just a certain complex but as we're looking at disease management, we need to look as the, the soil as being the environment and, and we need to figure out how to better manipulate that environment that's creating a favorable uh, situation for diseases to go rampant. I asked the question about copper. Uh, Coside is, is labeled in apples as a soil application and uh, it's extremely effective on Phytophthora cactorum. And so it'll be interesting to see if, if there's interest in developing a, a little bit of, of rates and timing uh, for copper sulfate. Uh, there's been a whole generation of new copper compounds that have been recently registered for uh, tree fruit bacterial diseases. Uh, but we find a number of these older compounds, uh, whether it's copper or just plain sulfur, that uh, help us break the resistance cycle and, and provide some improvement in disease um, control. So my talk is basically gonna talk a little bit about genetic solutions uh, that have occurred in the tree fruit industry, a little bit about soil treatments, AKA fumigation, and other cultural practices uh, that we've utilized, uh, such as irrigation management uh, that uh, and irrigation management and uh, variety selection that improve uh, performance of new orchards. I mentioned that I worked for 20 years uh, after graduating from Washington State University and in, uh, in, as a production consultant. I worked for 17 years with the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission looking at uh, evaluating plant materials, rootstocks, sign varieties for apples, pears, and cherries. And this spring, I went to work for North American Plants in McMinnville, Oregon, and it's a large tissue culture company that not only does apple, pear, and cherry rootstocks, uh, almond rootstocks, uh, hazelnut, whole trees, walnuts. Uh, we also do blackberries, raspberries, uh, and blueberries. And we're just now moving into growing whole trees of uh, apples, pears, and cherries, meaning that we have the rootstock and the sign variety uh, in one uh, component. When I was working with the Tree Fruit Research Commission, we started in 2003 looking at uh, rootstocks. Uh, we did 15 trials uh, looking at 69 different rootstock genotypes and over 11,000 trees. And as a result, uh, well, with a focus, on this uh, replant problem. And so we have these uh, very typical traits 
of uh, cut leaves, very small caliper shoots, uh, and, and very poor growth is very, very typical for a replant problem. And it is often uh, resembles uh, a lack of water or mildew. Uh, we also get tremendous mite pressure uh, in this sort of vigor uh, situation. In the Lake Land Valley, one of our Red Sox trials, uh, this is a guard row. And uh, if we look at this section here, uh, we had a particularly susceptible uh, genotype, uh, Budagovsky 9, and uh, that rootstock uh, died after three years of being in the unfumigated plots. And we found a genetic resistance in Geneva 214 uh, that looked like a normal tree. And so here's the fumigated plots uh, that we would consider an industry standard. Uh, and uh, it was pretty exciting to see a genetic solution to our replant problem. Uh, this particular hillside had been fallow for 70 years and the grower replanted it to uh, John of Gold on Malling 26, and the field died in two seasons after being fallow for 70 years. So, you know, our, our replant problem is um, more than just uh, being cured with uh, going fallow. One of the experiments that we also looked at as a genetic solution is the insect tolerance. Uh, we can see that the M9 portion uh, is definitely very well coated with woolly apple aphid and the Geneva 41 is uh, clean. In fact, we actually had some of those M9s in the greenhouse uh, leaning against the, the Geneva 41 and uh, they very carefully walked around the G41. Uh, and so after all those years and all those trials, uh, we identified uh, seven rootstock genotypes uh, that provided some replant tolerance and also five genotypes that also gave us uh, woolly resistance uh, or woolly aphid control. Uh, the bad news is, is that this only took 45 years from the initiation of uh, the screening uh, and uh, all the information that was developed in the breeding program uh, for rootstocks uh, were basically fundamental cause and effect. They took these apple seedlings, put them in trays, and then flooded them with root rot bacteria uh, and fungi, and uh, the survivors were then advanced to a fire blight inoculation where they clipped a leaf and put fire blight bacteria on the leaf. And uh, the survivors from that were advanced to the field for horticultural evaluation. And after about 25 years, they had some species that uh, we were able to uh, start these replant trials and found that th those very, very um, disease resistant rootstocks gave us uh, also replant tolerance. Rhizactonia, as it turns out, is a species that t uh, of uh, fungi that gives us a lot of very fine hair root uh, disease. And uh, these rootstocks are, are amazingly tolerant. Uh, so there's a USDA program for rosaceous crops uh, called Rosebreed. Uh, Rosebead 3. Uh, is looking at disease resistance. Uh, Cameron Peace at WSU Pullman uh, is a lead uh, person. Uh, it is amazing that in the last uh, 10 years, five years in particular, uh, the advances in uh, computer technology and uh, genetics allow us to find very specific uh, markers and traits uh, within the rosaceous family genome. Uh, Dory Main is also a WSU faculty member and she maintains the global, global database. Um, so the point being is that WSU has tremendous genetic uh, resources uh, for rosaceous crops such as raspberry, strawberry, apples, pears. 
and so on. So there's no time like the present to ask them to get going on nematode resistance and phytophthora resistance of raspberry. I mentioned previously that uh, our replant disease looks uh, a lot like drought uh, resist or drought symptoms, and we get a whole host of problems that are associated with uh, a small amount of shortage uh, of water, which includes mildew and mites and, and other things. We also have found that cropping too soon or too heavy also reduces the vigor of our plants and um, Another trait that we found is that not having enough plants in a row uh, dramatically increases our replant problems. And, and so as we plant, uh, increase the plant density, uh, we reduce the disease issues that we have with replant. So we have found that um, we have a number of cultural practices that can improve our performance. Uh, one of them is that um, move our planting rows into the old drive rows. Uh, that uh, for us has, has provided uh, some offset to the disease issue. Uh, we know that compaction, uh, the plow pan or tractor pan uh, is, is real. Uh, we have a number of volcanic soils that uh, would make excellent uh, highways uh, because over time they become incredibly hard. And uh, so we're encouraging growers to uh, do a deep rip, uh, 36 to 40 inches deep, uh, and make sure that we uh, try to reestablish good tilth uh, throughout the uh, soil profile. Along with that, of course, is drainage. Uh, we have wet soils and, and there's a few places in central Washington that we do need to use some tile. Uh, but we also have encountered uh, the need to do raised berms uh, and to change the soil chemistry. Uh, we have some high sodium uh, wells uh, and of course sodium uh, deflocculates the soil and makes it basically asphalt and um, impenetrable for water and roots. And, and so those treatments, it's not necessarily a berm like we would see in developing uh, strawberry beds, but it's a uh, total mitigation of combining soil uh, that's present in the field with uh, basically, uh, basically a potting mix uh, and uh, putting that into a berm that's large enough to uh, grow trees, uh, perhaps in these situations that we're looking at a more hydroponic situation where uh, the drip system is apply, supplying water and nutrition. And we found that uh, for long-term perennial crops that uh, some soil types are, uh, have very unique chemistry. Uh, the volcanic soils around Lake Chelan and in the Tut and Kawichi area uh, near Yakima, um, they actually have a slight positive charge. And so all the nutrition is held uh, very differently. And, and so our cations leach out and it, it's very, very easy for us to get extremely low pHs. The lowest pH that I found in the Lake Chelan area was uh, about 1.8. Uh, and we only had a, a lime requirement of 28 tons per foot. Uh, and our problem went two and a half, three feet deep. The really good news was that the, the soil tests were a little inaccurate and, and actually, you know, the textbook says that um, you have to rotivate lime in and, and in those volcanic uh, pumice soils, we actually had lime hitting the irrigation drains uh, within a year of application. So there's a lot of things that go on in soils that, that uh, we really need to pay attention to what the, the base materials of the soils are and make sure that uh, we understand what's going on, especially in the, in the rows of plant materials that are, we're farming. Uh, for years, uh, we, we noticed in the Lake Chelan area that uh, sulfur, uh, let's say ammonia sulfate, provided a great uh, 
plant improvement. And a lot of growers have, if a little is good, a more is better philosophy. So uh, they would throw hand applied fertilizers and they would throw it at the tree. And so we saw this huge gradation in pHs from near the trunk of the tree to the edge of our weed strip. And uh, so about every foot closer that we got to the, the trunk line, uh, we would have a full point uh, pH drop. So we would go six five, five five, four five, and and then a lot of soils right around the the trunk line of an old orchard in particular uh, would be in that one five to three five range. Another um, treatment that's being used in in trial basis is uh, we're looking at mitigation particularly of tight soils or heavy ground with the various uh, cover crops or, or fallow crops for a season and uh, we've seen some very interesting things happen in the Hood River area uh, and uh, the Dalles where they have very very heavy soils. Uh, a number of these kinds of uh, uh, seeds. Uh, some of them actually are uh, root crop type things and they really break apart the whole soil texture uh, as kind of a natural deep plowing. Um, all of these things uh, are have not been replicated uh, across large uh, numbers of farms and, and so there's two things is that we need to look at, at various components of seed mixes. Uh, th there's some specialty seed uh, companies that have amazing array of products uh, and there may be a particular mix that would be more efficacious in one region versus uh, or even one side of the county road versus the other side of a county road. So uh, the effect of these seed crops may be very localized. So do a test. That means a small application with a large check. It doesn't mean a large field treated uh, with no check. So don't bet the farm on any of those kinds of things. We've looked at uh, crop rotation and uh, the nursery industry in particular has used a lot of uh, crop rotations. Uh, they're looking at five to seven years uh, as much as a nutrition or, or rehabilitation of soil health uh, as replant. But in many, many, uh, nearly all of these cases that we have seen, uh, fumigation still give a tremendous uh, impact. Uh, I visited a nursery a few years ago that uh, they discovered just prior to digging uh, the finished tree crop uh, that there was a uh, tooth uh, on the fumigation application uh, manifold uh, and, and so they had this three foot strip right going across all the rows of the field where that fumigation uh, shank was plugged. And, and so, you know, they lost hundreds of trees across hundreds of rows of nursery because the, the fumigation application was uh, insufficient. Another issue that we found that's related to our genetics is that uh, Mark Mazzola, who's uh, kind of a root guy uh, at USDA Wenatchee, he's a plant pathologist, uh, and he's done a lot of what we'd call rhizosphere research, looking at the um, families of fungi growing in the rhizosphere or the, or the root zone of trees. And um, he has found that the root exudates from replant tolerant rootstocks such as G41 dramatically changes the soil biology compared to Malling 9 or Malling M7. Uh, and, and it reduces the presence of the bad guys um, uh, in the, the root zone of the replant tolerant rootstocks. And so we're seeing fundamental differences in the soil biology uh, in our replant tolerant genetics. Uh, even more interesting is that Ian Merwin of Cornell, 
uh, looked at some of the different family members of the Geneva uh, rootstocks and found that uh, changing the parents uh, from crop to crop, or I should say planting of apples followed by a different rootstock family uh, parents uh, improved the replant performance. Whereas if they used the same rootstock uh, in the same ground, uh, they developed a little bit more replant problem. So it's, it's intriguing to see that uh, the root exudates of the, the crop is fundamentally uh, interacting with the soil and creating uh, either some resistance or perhaps even some susceptibility to the crop uh, by particular pathogens. We found that really important component of fumigation effect is uh, making sure that we have excellent soil tilth. Um, so we need to mitigate compaction. Uh, we feel that especially in central Washington where our soil temperatures are pretty consistently high and uh, in our desert, we get almost three to four inches of rain a year. So, you know, uh, soil moisture, lack of moisture is a big problem because uh, products like Telone in particular will gas off way too quickly. Uh, and so we do have target uh, temperatures uh, for application, uh, but more importantly, uh, uh, especially where we have fields that have widely varying soil types, uh, we need to be fairly uh, cognizant that dry soils and fumigation uh, won't work very well. We have a drip irrigation label for Metham sodium and uh, uh, Metham also has soil temperature issues. Uh, the very interesting thing with Metham is that uh, it will move as far as the water does and uh, for us uh, we have actually found that uh, we typically over uh, apply water, uh, we get the fumigation too deep. Um, that's our number one issue has been with fumigation that uh, getting the right amount of water on variable soil types has been a really big problem and we typically over apply uh, water. Tim Smith, uh, a retired extension agent from WSU Wenatchee, uh, has strongly felt that perennial crop, following perennial crop, uh, deserves uh, fumigation. Uh, we think that some of these fumigation application failures have been uh, causing uh, less than 50% of the tree fruit acreage to actually be fumigated before replanting. Uh, and so application uh, is a big deal. All of our fumigation trials have had tremendous positive response uh, that we've more than paid for the application annually for seven to ten years after the application. We know that uh, uh, loosening the soil after fumigation has been real important for us to make sure that we've released the fumigation. Lastly, uh, irrigation has is, is been a, a really, really important thing. We need to understand that uh, newly planted uh, crops, uh, trees in particular, the root system is very, very small. And that water needs to be applied uh, to where the roots are and not to the soil profile as a whole like the textbook tells us. We also realize that we have a real range in tolerance and performance in replant ground uh, by variety and by rootstock. And so plant material, uh, your varieties, whether it's a compact growing uh, variety uh, or a very vigorous uh, variety will have an influence on your ability to manage diseases. Here's an example of uh, a rootstock uh, we look at the space between trees. This is a bud nine rootstock and here in the corner or on the edge, we can see a Geneva rootstock trial where the canopy is uh, much larger and, and much more consistent. And so 
Uh, this is a planting density issue, is that if we doubled the tree count in this planting, uh, this block could have had basically double the yield. And so that concludes uh, my presentation. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I noticed it kind of goes in, co coincide with what you said, is that the, uh, our raspberries uh, sometimes will have men 35, 40 years, uh, that, which is not the norm. But anyway, but when we soil test, uh, we went and did a test of one to three, three to six, and six to nine, just, just uh, down each level. And it was like morning, noon, and night. Most of the nutrients was in that top three inches. Uh, when we turn the field over and plow it, then it's all blended, the, uh, the full nine, 12 inches. Uh, so uh, and I guess maybe it's in a soil type that, uh, but I kind of thought everything was kind of leached down with the amount of rain we have here, but that's not really the truth. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, amazing that when you start doing uh, uh, soil profiles, because uh, for years uh, lead arsenic uh, was used uh, to control coddling moth, and um, uh, there are a lot of really bad assumptions, including by the Washington Department of Ecology, about where uh, lead arsenic is. You know that uh, when it was used for 20 years, it was amazing that it was just a small ring around the drip line of the trees. So when we went through and did a matrix of where the problems were, we found that lead arsenic uh, was originally uh, pointed to as our number one issue with replant. Uh, and, and so uh, we found that really the lead arsenic was only uh, about every 30 feet in a four inch band uh, and it went down six inches. So our, our principal problem was not uh, the lead arsenic. It was soil compaction was actually our number one problem. pH was our probably our number two problem. And then uh, these soil borne uh, diseases, which were controlled mostly by chloropicrin, or our first trials were done with uh, methyl bromide. So uh, we have a whole suite of problems in our replant uh, scenario, and uh, we need to fix all of them. Uh, fumigation is not a standalone um, solution. Great. Well, thanks, Tom. We're a little tight on time, so back I'm gonna, over here. Yeah. Let's Our friends from up. Florida. I was gonna say this is gonna be a good a good question. I can feel it. At what point in the soil profile do these compacted layers occur? Uh, our compaction would go uh, at least uh, two feet. Uh, we had some growers, especially in, in the pumicey soils of, of Lake Chelan, just got so ticked off at looking at these rutted little trees uh, that he took a high pressure hose and washed out the root system and uh, basically found that the orchard was planted in, in a road. Uh, the texture was just, you know, you you could drill a hole in it, uh, and, and at the time we planted a lot of trees by drilling a hole. Uh, now we use a, a shanked in uh, uh, tree planter that, that will open the soil and close it. But uh, in, in the pumice soils, it can go very, very deep. Are capable of causing these traffic pans to occur at two feet? That's oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, in, in our sprayers, we have 400 gallons of water, and so we're, we're pulling 3,200 pounds of water on a 3,000 pound sprayer on uh, itsy bitsy teeny weeny little tires. So we're able to uh, uh, create um, a lot of ruts. Great. So like I said, we're, I think you can tell we're a little behind schedule. So we're going to cut the break down to 10 minutes, take a tight 10 minute break. So if you can get, come back here at 1032, we've got another presentation and a great hour long hands-on session. So see you back here in 10 minutes.